It's July the 5th, 2015. I'm Dana Durford, also known as nuclearproctologist.org, and you can find these videos and video presentations at Beautiful Girl by Dana on YouTube. That's my channel. Many other people upload it, and if you're watching it over there, don't feel guilty that you got to come over here. And we like that, that people share the videos and that push this out there and have. I'm not saying that's something we need to do. I'm saying that's something that's, that's something that's done automatically. And I'm streaming. <laughs> you know, I just want to, before I forget to say this, and we're going to go to a little intro, but before I get to say this, I'm going to come say hi to everybody in a couple of minutes. But before I get to say any, uh, say everything else, you know, do you believe in Santa Claus? No, right? Do you believe in the Easter Bunny? Uh, no, right? These are well known, you know, they're not true. And the uh, Fukushima fuel pools are not true, are the same thing. But pe most people, not most people, but a lot of people do believe in that. And it's, it's like we used to believe in Santa Claus and we used to believe in the Easter Bunny. Uh, today's a very important video and a very interesting video, I think. And so here's an intro of the Expedition for Life. And so, that's an expedition that has spent uh, nine months on the ocean, Pacific coastline of Canada, British Columbia, and we covered around, um, well, one, one part of the expedition has covered over 8,000 miles of the coastline and documented it. And that documentation and is up at the nuclearproctologist.org. And before I forget about it, uh, Hell on Earth, uh, the tuna... They're selling tuna in a six pack, four packs, and stuff like that. And they'll put uh, Atlantic salmon can on the top, and the rest will honor the wrapper or Pacific. So you got to watch out for that if anybody is still uh, buying tuna and stuff like that. And um, the nuclearproctologist.org, we'll go back to what we were just talking about. Uh, Louise Narls. This is um, this is an amazing amount of toy that goes through here, and the reason being, we got underwater a video there for people who want to come and see that later. Haven't seen it, and you can see this little narl. This is a big island on the, in the Haida Gwaii archipelagos off the coastline of British Columbia, where I was a couple of months ago. And it's about 70 miles off the coastline, 50 miles off the 26,000 archipelagos along the coastline, and it's a separate 350 kilometer long archipelago, 15 mile, 50 miles off the coastline archipelagos of Canada. I know that's a little bit confusing, but you got to think about how 26,000 islands and then the coastline of Canada itself, and then the archipelagos on the outside. And so there's amazing tide here in British Columbia. You get 18, 20 foot tide exchanges in a five hour period and that will flood through this gap and so that gap is notorious um, people have come and covered this place for eons no, I shouldn't say those words but since we've been uh, exploring the coastline 125 years that's a big difference for me and Dana and the coastline is shocking this was once a unbelievable thriving amazing life and now, you know, you can go look up pictures of Louise and Earls. I can't use them here because people will take out false, uh, like Eco Jones done against me before we got the video back up. I know <laughs> tweets his pictures out, and he he filed a false complaint against me, and that's um, we should get that into the courts, and and because that was illegal to do. And we definitely should get that in the courts. And we can show, I got the screen captures from the University of Victoria. If you're not familiar with him, he's a nuclear apologist. will tell you there's a thousand times more natural radiation in fish than there is man-made. And therefore, there's nothing to worry about. 
Well, it doesn't work that way. If there's a single atom in that fish, somebody's going to eat that atom because most people can't eat a whole fish. And they share it with their families and, and friends and, and loved ones. And one of them is going to eat that atom, and a cancer will show up, an autoimmune deficiency in 15 or 20 years. And I'm going to digress if I don't watch what I'm saying here today because we, we got, i got a project for everybody today. We're just going to jump into it. And we'll just come over and say hi to everybody very quick. Uh, and I don't mean quick, quick, because I, I don't do that with people. I like to say hi to them. Illusion is over because we don't get a chance to live stream very much. And we got so much to get through. Candace, I'm just going to take my time. It's going to be over an hour, most likely. And it could go on a lot longer. Nuts for Art. And uh, Thomas, I didn't see Thomas's comment there. Thomas Ackerman, you'll find his links below. We really like Thomas. You know, Thomas is... Uh, it's not about Fukushima per se, it's about that human spirit and that ability to have a visions as an artist that he brings to the table like Kevin Blanche. Here's a video of Kevin Blanche. Let's play that. And you'll find Thomas's link below. I really like Thomas because I'm able to get clear of the technical parts of Fukushima and get back to the human perspectives of Fukushima and I don't really see anybody doing that. And Thomas doesn't get any attention, but he's got a, a, an amazing amount of inspiration on his site. And so does Kevin. And Kevin, of course, uh, needs no introduction. I don't think he does, but he does in one sense, because at one time I didn't know who Kevin was. And I, Kevin is hard to take if you don't understand him. And you're, you're looking for serious data. But make no mistake that if you go listen to Kevin Blanche's radio shows, you'll find out that he is a plethora of data and wealth, unbelievable wealth. And, and I mean that in the strongest terms possible, a wealth. You know what wealth is. It's something you covet, right? Everybody covets. Uh, because you got to have it in order to have a lifestyle at all. Well, he has a wealth of information that you, you can't... If he ever wrote a book, you know, it'd be an amazing book, trust me. Anyway, here's Kevin. Uh, down in an IAE, a meeting in a foreign country, and you know, goes down there by himself and takes on these scumbags, and he startles the daylight set of one of the presenters, one of the nuclear apologists. Get a load of this. Here we go. Here we go. No more killing people for money. No more. Here's your couple, your big IAEA board right here. These are your kingpins right here. IAEA are mass murderers. They killed the Pacific Ocean. You, thanks for giving me leukemia. The IAEA are mass murderers. Mass murders the IAEA. What happens when you get cancer? What happens when you get it? What happens when you give yourself cancer? We'll keep these going. Stay on tuned. Awesome. So Kevin really stuck it to him. Now, I'm going to pay, play, pay, play a couple of clips. And the first one is a Japanese clip. And, you know, he's talking about how 15 reactors are three-hour train ride away from Tokyo. And think about the manpower that a reactor site needs. And then think about the manpower that a reactor site needs part-time. Because they don't want to send their workers into the danger zone because they have to pay the health care. So what you do is they, well, let this guy explain it. He's much better than me. I am Kenji Higuchi. I stumbled upon these stories as a young photographer 20 years ago. It changed my life. The scenes I saw, the stories I heard, I found them difficult to believe at first. That workers go near their reactor and get exposed, and that many of them become ill with radiation sickness and sometimes die. Or that these people are farmers and fishermen, or even laborers picked off the streets in the slums of Osaka and Tokyo. But when I started looking, I found so many of these people, people who didn't know what had happened to them, or if they did, too frightened to speak out. The thing that struck me was that all their stories were the same. During these years, 
I have scratched below the surface and have discovered the underside of Japan, a site the world knows nothing about. People simply don't believe this can happen in a country like Japan, a country where the companies are famous for treating workers so well. Three hours train ride from here lies the nuclear Ginza. Fifteen reactors lined up one after the other along the Japan Sea coast. Among them, the world's first fast breeder reactor built last year. So, you've got to take into consideration, you know, that this is real, that they do go into the slums and take people, go into nuclear power plants and do, and I mean, there's a long history of this. It's, it's well known if you're in the industry itself. It's a joke. They joke about it. They're like, I can't go in there. You better get a whole bunch of homeless people first. And you think I'm kidding. I'm not. These are... Um, not cynical people, these are soulless, uh, or emotionless, I think. These are what we can call robots or psychopaths, where they, they're not capable of having empathy or, you know, they once discovered a cure for apathy and nobody was interested type people. Uh, now we're going to jump through these clips, but I want to come over back and say hi to everybody. Nuts for Arts, Candace. Mindy, made it, gruesome. Yeah, Kevin has some good stuff. Wanda, woof. Ooh, the hounds of Fukushima. Illusion is over. You'll find a link below to Kate's site, which is a chat room. It's an independent room. And uh, Illusion is over. Said, no yelling. Got a hangover. You got to put a finger in your ear and then ram your elbow down on the shit. And then the headache will go away and your ear will hurt. Hi, Stan. That's a joke. Oh, sorry. Illusion knows I'm joking. Elmwood. I'm just going to get through anybody that I didn't say hi to originally. Starlight. Made it. Billy. Jay made it. And Billy Jay started off the Ackerman conversation. <laughs> okay. There, that's where it emanated from. Good stuff. Yeah. And NHD was just dropping in and out. And so was... Um, who else was dropping in a bit? In and out here. Nuts for Art? I can't remember. I think it was Nuts for Art was telling us. You know, I once blocked Nuts for Art. And when he originally showed up, he had, um, or she, or them, had said something, and I'm, I'm getting attacked by trolls so much, I just got into this habit of blocking everybody that I don't understand. That's, that was stupid, obviously. And so he contacted me, and um, I unblocked him, of course. I'm very grateful to have them around. Nice people. Let me keep going. Hell on Earth. Uh, looked that article up. If I can find the rest of it. Yeah, Hell on Earth. And uh, line three. For the next 10 days, this is uh, Chernobyl. Spewed equivalent 400 Hiroshima bombs. 400 Hiroshima bombs went into the environment. And so Fukushima's reactors are three times the size as Japan's reactors. Or Japan's reactors behind me are three times the size as Chernobyl. Chernobyl was only a 30% meltdown. So what are each of these meltdowns compared to Chernobyl? It was a breeder reactor and mixed oxide fuel. And so the elements were already two million times worse than any other element on the planet. Okay, and we got another bombshell I'm going to throw out here before I move on. That dispersal, by the way, is based up on a single release from a single reactor, from this reactor right here. That model doesn't include the 100% meltdown of that reactor, and it doesn't include the, the, the releases from that reactor unit. So you can see that's totally 100% destroyed. Unit 4 was right alongside of it. You can see that's amazingly completely destroyed. There's no way to repair that. You know, think about the reactors how the industry told you that the containments never breached, right? Of course they did. And they, they still like come out and lie in the comment sections of all the articles about it. But we forced them, because when I started this two years ago, Dana and the Hounds of Fukushima, they wouldn't admit there was three melted reactors. Now everybody admits that. We forced that out relentlessly. 
to the point where they couldn't deny because we show you the picture and you can't deny the picture. See? You know what I mean? But anyway, all the models, and I'll come back to down, finish off what I was going to, uh, the, the bombshell I'm going to drop on everybody here in a few moments. So none of the reactors, only the Unit 1, that was Unit 4 you were just looking at. Only Unit 1 was in this model. This model was only for a couple of days' releases. Chernobyl lasted 10 days, and Chernobyl was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. And so Chernobyl, you still can't eat the meat in Ireland, and not all, all the spots, but you shouldn't probably, most likely, never eat the meat there forever because the radiation doesn't disappear and turn to fairy dust, okay? And so they go on the model of cesium, and the cesium lasts 300 years, but 26 years later, they lifted the ban on most of the UK, Scotland, Ireland, um, and you're allowed to drink the milk, and you're allowed to eat the meat, but still certain spots there, you can't. But they kind of give up on it. So this model you're looking at is missing the fuel pools. The fuel pools were where they took the reactor cores out, and I'm going to get to that bombshell in a second. I'm just setting the stage for it. Each reactor, 3,450 assemblies in the reactor themselves, three 100% meltdowns like I was showing you earlier. And each assembly is 80 rods. That's 280,000 rods, not 1,150 rods like a lot of the alternative media is telling you at all. See? The fuel pools weren't empty. They were full. All of them. And think about the reactors are in the middle of hundreds of miles of coastline that's completely ripped to pieces, communities wiped away, entire infrastructures completely annihilated, thousands of people swept out to sea, entire 2,000 square miles of debris on the ocean, but the reactors were okay, Dana. It doesn't work that way. Nothing else survived, the reactors didn't either. How could they... If it, Hundreds of, th hundreds of square miles, hundreds of miles rather, a coastline and up to 10 miles inland. This tsunami, 50 feet high, took everything with it, smashed everything to pieces, wrecked everything. Whatever left behind was totally destroyed. Those reactors could not possibly, you know, they, they detonated, right? They detonated on top of that. And so, I'll just finish out on that inconsequential that, you know, I'm telling you something that I say over and over and over and over and over. And it just becomes inconsequential. Uh, it wasn't the word I sh should be using. It's not even the word. What I should be using, you know, look at your water table here in Canada. i got to find a better way to say this, uh, come up with a proper way to say this. Look at your, this is man-made nucleoids in your water. Okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting to your bombshells. Some people, it's probably not going to be a bombshell, but to me, it's a bombshell. I just spent four days looking at it. And so the radioactive fallout is throughout North America in particular because the jet streams come right across the ocean. The Pacific current, the Kurosha current at five miles an hour will get here in 45 days. And every day behind it was another plume because it didn't stop coming out. It's not like Chernobyl, but Chernobyl stopped after 10 days. Fuck, I hate this part of the, what I do. And so, you got radiation in your water now. Stupid amount. It's not supposed to be in liters, it's supposed to be in cubic meters. And so tritium, the man made with an extra electrons, neutrons bombardment done to it, it's ionized and radiated, is 7 million beckles in a cubic meter. That's your hot dog. Okay, that's fresh water we're talking about. So I went up to a 32 mile lake for the last four days and I put about 170 nautical miles on the boat, on the, on the Intrepid. And for anybody who's not familiar with the Intrepid, I'll give you a quick picture. I'll come right back to that. So that's the Intrepid. It's a highball operation. It's meant to go out and come back no matter what with the data. And it's been the hell and back over and over and over and over. Well, 
I've been the hell and back. The boat can handle it. I can't. And so I'm, I'm setting the stage. This fallout, this was over a million barrels, not this particular model, but the actual numbers have come out. It's over a million barrels per square meter. Hang on. Show it a million back walls a square meter. Fukushima plume model, a square meter. That's not a cubic meter that you're walking through of here, a cubic meter, right? That's a square meter. That's where you're walking. That's where you're stepping on, a cubic meter. A square meter, right? Meter square. So how could you get a million back walls a square meter? Because it fell out. And like a, we've seen rainwater in California with 20 million becquels a liter, a liter. Rain doesn't fall by the liter, so 20 million, 40 million, 60 million, 80 million, 100 million, just all day and all night long. Every time there's a liter falls in a square. So telling you there's a million becquels in a square meter is that's lowballing it. Okay. So all your fresh water. It, it, come to, it comes in and it hits your coastline. I'll show you that. It comes, that stuff comes in and falls out. Everything on the west side of the Rocky Mountains goes back towards the Pacific, washes, not all the way. It ends up in your estuaries and your rivers and your lakes. So I just spent four days on a lake. That's the point of everything I just told you. And at the bottom of the lake where I started out, there's 18 geese. Now, geese eat grass. Grasses. They're not eating little tadpoles and fish and everything else, okay? And so a 32-mile lake, I would expect to see a thousand ducks, and mallards, and common ducks, and black teals, and soots. And there's a just an amazing amount of birds that have migratory through British Columbia on top of the residential birds. It's not just migratory birds that are coming and going. There's an amazing amount of residential birds all year long. British Columbia is a tropical paradise in Canada. I've never worn none but sneakers and shoes. I don't wear, you don't wear boots up here because there's no snow all winter long. The lakes don't freeze over, only the ones at the very top of the mountains. There is no snow in the mountains. It's down to about 1% of what was there. It's really something. This this was, and nobody's talking about this right now. If I'm going to smoke a cigarette. It's not the cigarette with the 7,000 chemicals in it. Right? Who woke up one morning and said, hey, I got a great idea. Let's put 7,000 chemicals in a cigarette. Because that's what you're smoking in your average cigarettes. So you got to find tobacco with no chemicals, smoke that, and then you can quit. But you, got to, you have to break that addiction of those 7,000 chemicals. But anyway, on the lake, 32 mile lake, full of nooks and crannies, I never found anything. I never seen any fish jumping and no eagles feeding. The locals told me that, one of the locals see me yesterday and the day before had told me that just after I left, two loons had come in. Now those loons have been studied up there for a long time in, in that lake. <clears throat> and I haven't done a whole lot of lakes, so I'm not really going to get in. But I just wanted to, you know, because I can't get that off my mind that after four days I can't find a duck or a seagull or a crow. That doesn't mean they're not there. I heard sparrows in, in the woods. I'm talking about in the water itself. I know that people will go out and they'll find a bird and say, See, Dana, there's a bird. Well, I went 170 miles on the lake. See? And I took my time on sunny days, see? And it's, a, and it's not a very wide lake, see? And I spent my whole life on the ocean, my whole life on boats. And I've done literally every industry in the Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean of Canada, bar nothing, including the experimental industries. And so I know a thing or two, too, see? And it's people like you that think that way and talk that way and believe that bananas are created by reactors that got us into this mess. 
It's people like you that got to, we got to put an end to. It's the morons and the idiots that work for the industry that I'm talking about. There's enough morons and idiots out there because of those people. Because we can't have a conversation because people think that a banana is created by a reactor. That potato chips somehow got something to do with a reactor. That flying on an airplane somehow got something to do with a reactor. And walking in the sunshine somehow got something to do with a reactor. Because we will never have a conversation until that red rig is dealt with. That anybody who says that is my mortal enemy forever. I will hate your guts forever. I will hate everything about you till the end of time. I will never forgive you for being stupid or an outrageous lawyer. That time is past. When I can't find any life outside of 1% to 1%, what should be in the ocean? And that's documented at the nuclearproctologist.org. Uh, is is a very legitimate site. All we do is document it. We show you the charts, the GPS. We're 100% accountable. Click left of the screen to go back a picture. Date, you know, go right ahead on the picture. These are the raw data that I'm uploading on that site. And that, you know, I can, these are very high quality. I can zoom in and extract you know, six, seven pictures, high quality pictures out of each of these pictures. And I'm going to have to do that to have a debate, to have a conversation. Look at a rare life. This was such a rare picture. This one little picture here coming up. See that little tiny speck of life? Should be 600 allergies there. You should never see that guy. He should be under 600 allergies, hit away. Along with 30 or 5,600 other species. Highly visible species should be right there. That is recognized as indigenous to the coastline that is not there. That less than 100 species exist on the entire coastline of Canada. And then now that I go up into the freshwater lakes and I find no birds except for the 18 residential geese that spend most of their time eating the grass and pooping on the grass there. They had no babies. Now, I don't know if they're supposed to have babies this time of year. I'm just saying there was no babies in, you know, in, in, you know, all the flowers are in full bloom here. It's almost 30 degrees every day for the last six weeks since I've been back from the expedition. We were, you know, I was gone 160 days, five months. I'm so burnt out you can't even conceive it. You can't imagine what I go through all day, every day, to, to do what I do, to just to do the little things that I do, just to try to get something accomplished. How worn out I truly am. We've covered over 9,000 headlines. Do you know what it takes for me to, to, to get this done all the time and to find this and to source it out and why I would do something like that because I need to prove it? We covered 9,000 headlines before we went on the ocean. We never went out there Oh my goodness, there's something wrong. We went and sourced it out. We went and looked it through everything. We had, to, we had to prove what each picture of the reactor looked like because nobody would do that. We done that. We forced that out there. We are responsible for that. The fact that the Wikipedia even admits there's three melted reactors in Japan and that all the media now say that right away. But go back pre our existence here and you'll find out it was a very rare mention and when it was a mention, it was mentioned with bananas and potato chips and walking in sunshine. We forced him to have some kind of accountability and actually say those words. There's three melted reactors. Even <laughs> now emits. And we've covered it many times on my YouTube channel here. We forced the minute went up to two, the end of 2013 in December, he was still telling everyone if there was a melted reactor in Japan, that might be something to be concerned about. Yet Harvard and Stanford and MIT came out on March the 14th, the 15th, and the 16th and told everyone that one single time. 
You got to think about. That's how it works. They got to tell you the truth, and then they don't mention it again. Because then they go back, oh, well, we told you that. Yeah, but you never put it in context ever again. Okay, I'm going to jump over to another video clip. I want you to really truly understand, and this, these clips are coming from E&E &E News. They've done a wonderful job putting together these clips, and I thought they deserve more attention. And so this next clip, we're just going to go ahead and play it. Here we go. If you don't verify the report, you don't know the accuracy of the report. That's why when these workers told me, do you know we are actually living in a in a shanty town? I can show the photograph. Literally on a pavement, in a non-used pavement between the railway station, there were plastic cuts where people were living. In Japan, in Tokyo. This is not Bombay. So I it actually astounded me that these things were happening. And then they told me that there are people who come take them, they give them X amount of money because they have been working as contract workers for, for God knows how many years. So they are the people available. They have the skills. They are ready to go into the fire and die. Other people are not ready to do it. So what I am saying is, so when a report like this comes out, you can't just paint it as, oh, it's X, Y, Z. You have to be careful in scrutinizing it. So you need proper scrutiny. And what is happening is we don't it's a good thing that you started to actually start criticizing them. Nobody's been criticizing them. Nobody criticizes them. Nobody even marginalizes them. Everybody tells you it's like a banana and a potato chip walking in the sunshine getting a dental x-ray. A dental x-ray, you turn it on, you turn it off. You never ingested a particle that's pulsing every second at a couple of hundred thousand kilometers an hour inside your body, smacking away at your DNA and your chromosomes every second that the more you get in the more you're destroying and you're drinking and and eating and breathing this stuff now for over four years especially in North America. The fuel rods are kept cool in the storage pool on the top floor of each of the three reactors and they need to be removed to free up space for the robots to go down the containment cha uh, chambers. Look at it, what they just told you though. See that? There's no roof, and, and I mean, your time was 78,000, 9,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. Everything is inside of it was cannibalized and was atomized in aerosols and released. Right? It detonated on top of that. 7 or 8,000, 9, 7, 8, 9,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. 7, 8, 9, let me say that again. 7, 8, 9,000. 7, 8, 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. Would you send your children in there? If there's a room there with seven, eight, nine thousand, would you send your your children in a room if it was 110 degrees? No. Would you send your children in a room at 120 degrees? No. Would you send them in at 200 degrees? No. Would you, would you let your children get in the oven and turn the oven on 400 degrees? No. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Ask yourself that question. Would you send your children into an oven at a thousand degrees? A kitchen oven can get a thousand degrees. Would you put them in that oven and let them play with it? Would you? No, of course not. Would you would you walk in a room at a thousand degrees? Would you walk in a room at two thousand degrees? Would you wash it walk in a room at four thousand degrees? No, you wouldn't. Hey buddy. Hey, buddy. Would you would you walk in a room at six thousand degrees? I'm going to play you a little clip here. I'm going to play you a little clip. Hang on. So this clip is, like the last clip, they're, they're telling you how they picked up the homeless workers in the shanty towns, right, and brought them in to work on the dangerous stuff at the nuclear power plant because the nuclear power plant workers, if they get cancer, you got to pay for their health care. And so they don't want nuclear power plant workers getting cancer because it goes into statistics. So they go and get these homeless people. So they pick them up off the street for nuclear work. They've done that in Winfield at the UK, right? Hang on a second. Here we go. When the robots broke down because of the extreme radioactivity, men were sent in to clean up the site. They were not volunteers. They were picked up off the streets and press ganged onto the roof.
So, radioactive fallout. You know, taking these homeless people against their will, and bring them in to work on the nuke, just scooping them off the street. I mean, you got to, what kind of monster could go out and do that? People who work for the nuclear industry, they had no problem at all. Oh, yeah, well, we're not going to go in there. You, you want to go in there? No. They took people from theaters, right? That was the wrong clip that time. But they took people from theaters down in the UK, the two back rows, put them on a bus, brought them into the nuclear power plant. Don't believe me? Here. To, to push the burning fuel through uh, into the back of the reactor. But the heat had melted the cartridges, so they'd become stuck inside the core. They were forced to use scaffolding poles they'd found nearby to try and push the cartridges out. Radiation was so intense they could only work a few hours. They were running out of firefighters. The police uh, from the factory had turned up looking for volunteers. Uh, and they brought a bus and they decided the best way to get the volunteers was to go to the cinema and uh, and volunteer the back two rows uh, at the uh, at the show to go into the factory to, uh, as it turned out, to uh, help push the fuel rods out of the uh, out of the reactor. To push the fuel rods out of the reactor, to use scaffolding poles. Talk about improvising. And he used people from theater. Imagine your children are at that theater. Imagine if you were at that theater. Imagine that that'll happen again. Then they'll do the same thing. Imagine that they'll, they'll do whatever it takes so their loved ones don't go in there. So that they don't get any cancers. But no, Dana, it's like a banana. It's like a potato chip, Dana. It's not. See that creature behind me? It's from the University of Victoria. That guy is truly a monster. He goes around the communities telling people it's like a banana. It's like potato chips. There's a thousand times more natural radiation, and no matter what you eat, than there is from Fukushima. So he's alluding that there's radiation from Fukushima. If you got a fish, there's six pieces of it, and there's only one atom there with an isotope, excuse me, from Fukushima. And six of you eat that fish, one of you just drew the short straw. And you're going to get very sick cancers in five or ten years. That's the gallows left. Because... This industry doesn't pick up homeless people for something to do. No, it picks them up because it, they're not going to go in there. You're not going to see Harvard. Well, we were in Fukushima Diachi. You're not going to see Yale. Oh, we were at Fukushima Diachi. You're not going to see MIT or Stanford or Oxford or Cambridge or any of the other creepy monsters that work for these institutions. Anybody that works for any of those institutions is a nuclear PR firm, period. They use temporary workers to do the dangerous work. Here's an, here's an enlightening clip. By dividing up territory and dividing up the working classes. So when there was an accident, when there was some dangerous ground that needed to be worked in, if they needed to build new reactors under smokestacks or work along the river, they sent in these temporary workers, prisoners from the camps nearby, um, workers from PASCO, minority laborers from PASCO, and they sent them in, in as basically jumpers to work in dangerous ground unmonitored for a couple of months, maybe a couple of years, and then these people would leave. And they'd leave with them any possible radioactive isotopes they had ingested, and they'd leave with them any epidemiological trace. Right? Disposable. Everybody's disposable except for them. You know, I just want to remind you, hang on, let's do that one. This is what 10 years of radioactive fallout from nuclear testing in America. Now these lines are based upon at least two wind directions from two separate tests in a 10 year period, open air testing. But they done that so the Ruskies wouldn't do that to you. That's the CIA's model of what would happen if Russia Russia, Russia attacked you with nuclear weapons. They done all of that to you, or they were they were worried about that. It was too, and so they done that to you every decade, worse and worse and worse. And it doesn't go away and turn to fury dust. I got one more clip for you that I'm gonna play, and.
So let me get some background on that before I hit it. Women. For the worst jobs, women back in the day were always, and they knew back in the 40s how dangerous radiation was. They had no illusions about it whatsoever, and they hate women. And you still see that today. And women are affected much quicker, much easier, much longer um, issues associated with women than there is with the males. The wi and I'll just play that clip for you. Uranium fuel cells and, and run them through a series of chemical baths to distill away these tiny grams of plutonium. That job was often given in both countries to women even though those, it turns out, were the dirtiest jobs. And, and at DuPont, they were saying, well, you know, what, what do you think? They'd write the Army Corps, maybe, you know, because we're going to make this super poisonous product, we shouldn't hire women who are younger than a menopausal age. You know, what about fertility problems? What about um, mutants and monsters and offspring? You know, they would write these letters. They were real nervous about it. When, when people say, oh, they didn't know much about radiation in the 1940s, that's absolutely not true. They knew a great deal. And they were worried. Yeah, they knew a great deal. They were worried. They they were they wrote letters. They were worried about the women having mutant children. And now we see off Hanford, children born with deformed heads at an extraordinary rate per population. Just an incredible rate. So, you know, I drove from Prince Rupert down here to Powell River and I counted 72 birds. When I got down here by the big communities I could see a hundred birds in front of the community. These were the residential birds and they're always living close to these communities and that's where they hang out in those communities and they have alternate sources. I never seen no fish jumping on the lake in the last four days. I never seen a single bird on the lake in the last four days. 32 miles long I put 170 miles on the boat. We put over 8,000 miles on the boat up the coastline. There can be no mistake Fukushima is an extinction level event. There, there is no mistake in this now. If nothing was ever going to drive it home to me like it was yesterday, you know, when I knew that was my last day, because we're leaving tomorrow morning if all goes well. If not, it'll be Tuesday morning very early. And so we raised almost enough. Uh, nothing, you know, nothing's going to stop the trip on going anyway. And so we're going to have to keep asking for money to come in. We need to raise at least another, you know, I would imagine, before the trip is out, because we're going to get stuck up there in bad weather. You know that's coming. It's blow, it blew northwest, which is the worst wind possible, for almost three weeks, so we've been stuck here. The weather's going to be okay, get us up there, we're going to stay there and get the job done. We might have to stay an extra week, if possible, and do more of that coastline. Afraid the weather pin us down again and we won't get back up. It's debatable, you know, Terry might have to come home. And so, tomorrow or the next day I'm going to be bailing out of here and heading up north. I needed to go look at the fresh water. I needed I knew what I was gonna see, but I needed to see no fish jumping. I needed to see no birds floating, diving, feeding, hovering. And there's a plethora of birds, not counting the migratory birds, but there's just a plethora of residential birds that you would expect to find. Because we don't get ice in the wintertime. It doesn't freeze. Most of these lakes are not gonna freeze over in the wintertime. That lake is not. And it's so like it's it's emblematic of the work that got to get done, that we're going to have to switch gears this summer and go hit a whole bunch of freshwater lakes, before I can come out and officially say anything, because otherwise they're just going to lose their minds, and it has to be done. We you know that's I think might be the only way we're actually going to get to their head. Is we're going to have to push back, a lot harder. Your guys are going to have to push back. I'm heading on the ocean. You guys are going to have to get out there and challenge these people. They fear your voice. They fear your tweet. They fear your Facebook. They fear, they dread your YouTube videos. They have to show up with the trolls. Just pick a little subject and say, look, a banana's got nothing to do with 
man-made radiation. Bananas are good for you. It's homeostasis. Your body regulates it. Everything on the planet regulates it. That's why we all exist in harmony with it. We're acclimated through genetic superior selection. But these atoms, that's why they send in all those homeless people. That's why they used, that's why they victimized people, particularly like the women. Just, it's that reoccurring thing, they hate women. Everything out there that is evil is attacking women first and the male second. They're feminizing the males with soy uh, from the GMO. Okay, I'm going to take off again. Look, I had to put out a little video before because I don't know when I'm going to get an opportunity to get anything out of packing and loading up everything. I'm going to run off and fuel up everything right now and visit with a friend of mine. And I've got to go see my kid before it takes off. And so, but I'm planning on getting out here daily tomorrow morning, so I got a stupid amount to get through the day, and I'll be running thin to get out tomorrow morning. It's got to be in the morning or Tuesday morning at the latest. And so if I'm stuck here on Monday, I'll do because uh, I'll, I'll have everything ready and done. Then I will do another stream, but I probably won't see because I probably will get out tomorrow morning because it's got to get done. Hugs for everybody. Sylvia, Starlight, Elwood, Nick Killer, BK, Thomas Lee. Cotton Top, hi Mickey, hi Cookie, hi Wapa, Bob, yeah, good night folks, good day folks, Billy J, and Candace, and everybody else that didn't show up, I know it will show up, uh, Sergeant York, I'm just saying hi to everybody that happens to be here, Wanda Elmwood, Bob, I'm probably going to miss a dozen people, okay, and hugs for everybody, you know. We're definitely doing the right thing. There could be nothing more, nothing more shocking for me than four days on the lake and not see anything. A 32-mile lake and 170 miles on that boat. The, you know, if there was, if I did need something, if I did have a moment of doubt, that was shredded over the last four days. Hugs. Take care, folks.